I read a strange book a while back where the author was arguing that the Buddha was too sophisticated to hold to the concept of truth, that there were no truths would be true for everybody. And that for some reason the Buddha didn't call the Four Noble Truths the Four Noble Truths. He called them the Four. Because the word noble, of course, is just advertisement. That was what the author was saying. Basically, the Buddha was telling you, each of us should find our own truth. And he was just giving suggestions. When you read something like that, a good way to take a reality check is to look in the Vinaya. Because that shows how the Buddha would deal with real life issues, not just abstractions. And it's obvious from the Vinaya that your perceptions can either be true or false. Many of the rules make allowances for cases where you perceive something to be X even when it's actually Y. In other words, you see something which you think is an inanimate lump, and you sit down on it, and it turns out that it's an animal and you've killed it. You didn't perceive it as an animal, so there's no offense. But if you perceived it as an animal, your perception was true, and you intentionally sat down on it to kill it, okay, that would be an offense. So obviously there are true and false perceptions. Given, of course, the fact that every perception is a sketch. When you perceive an animal, you don't perceive all the details of the animal. You perceive just enough to know that for the purposes of that rule it counts as an animal. Basically, this is a pragmatic approach to truth. You alter the different perceptions. You're trying to make them as accurate as possible. So you can know what to do with whatever comes up. For example, sensual desire comes up. There are lots of different ways you could look at it. You could say, well, this is simply a result of my past conditioning, or it's something I enjoy thinking about. Or you could remind yourself, okay, this is a hindrance. And for the purposes of mindfulness, what do you do with hindrances? You try to abandon them. That's part of the, the duty with regard to the Four Noble Truths. And so in that case, the correct perception for the purpose of the path is that you sort things out to see which Noble Truth they fall under. In this case, it falls under the cause of suffering. So you've got to abandon it. So when the Buddha says that perceptions are mirages, he's not saying that they're totally without substance and totally without relationship to reality. The question simply is, for what purpose are you using your perceptions? And when a perception is useful for one particular instance or one particular situation, is it going to be useful in another? For example, when you're sitting here with the body right now, when you're moving around, you want to have a very clear sense of where your arms are, where your legs are, so you don't bump into things. But as you're sitting here, you can get the sense of the body so refined that the sense of even having a body here begins to disappear. You can put aside your perception of the form of the body when the breath gets really still. You can hold a perception of space. And that's a choice you make. You could hold on to your perception of the shape of the body. There are enough sensations here, even when the breath is still, that you can maintain that perception. But if you're trying to get the mind into something that's more subtle, more refined, you can change your perception. Or before you go to space, a John Fung would recommend that you perceive all of the different elements in the body and amplify them for a bit. You've worked with the breath, it gets more and more refined, it gets more and more subtle, to the point where the breath energy fills the body. 
All the breath channels in the body are connected, and the breath can go still. Then he would have you think about fire. There's the warmth in the body. Where do you feel the warmth in the body in the midst of that stillness? Focus on that. Hold the perception of fire in mind. You could even have an image of a fire burning, but make sure that you're also in touch with a sensation of warmth. And then remind yourself that there's a certain amount of warmth throughout the body. Some parts may be warmer than others, but in the same way that you connect the blatant breath with the more subtle breath energies in the body, try to connect the different sensations of warmth. And just hold that perception in mind. Although on a warm day like this, you might prefer water. Okay, think about the cool sensations in the body, and they're there as well. Make a survey of the body, see which spots seem to be cooler than others, and focus there. Think of cool water. And then connect up with other cool sensations in the body. And again, you find that they can fill the body. You begin to get a sense of the power of perception. Different perceptions, but they're all equally true. The question is, what, which ones do you want? On a warm day like this, water is a good one. When you go someplace where it's cold, focus on the warmth. And then there's then there's earth, the solidity of the body. Think of the body as being, the body as being one large, solid lump here. Hold that perception in mind. And depending on the power of your concentration and your ability to stay focused on single perceptions, you find you can get a very strong sense of solidity. John Fung had a student one time who, as he was going through the different elements, found that he had this perception that his body was made out of brass. It was that solid. Okay, that's extreme. Then the next exercise that John Fung would have you do is to bring everything into balance. Balance the warmth with the coolness, balance the lightness and energy of the breath with the solidity of the body, so everything feels just perfectly right and balanced. Then he would have you focus on the sensation of space. The canon recommends that you think about the space in the ears, the space in the nose. But you can also think about all the space between the atoms and in the atoms of your body, and that permeates everywhere. And that ultimately is where you want to Go is just space everywhere, permeating everything. This too is a perception. It's a different perception from the ones you've been dealing with, but it's equally true. There is that aspect of space throughout your sensation of the body. Then you can ask yourself, well, what is it that's aware of the space? That's when you can have a perception of consciousness. Awareness, knowing. And again, depending on how strong your concentration is and how steady your ability to stick with one perception is, you have a very strong sense of awareness just filling everything. From there, John Fung would ask, if you ask, what happens if you put aside this perception of the mind being one? The mind goes to a perception of nothingness. This takes you pretty much as far as perception can go, but you've learned an important lesson. Perceptions are a sketch. They focus on different aspects of reality, and some, some are true, some are false. But you can have lots of different true perceptions about just the body sitting here. There's one, Dogen. The Zen master would have you ask questions about well, what's, what, is it, what is it to sit here? Do you perceive that the body is in the mind? In other words, is the body in your range of awareness? 
Or is the awareness in the body? Either perception would be valid. Which one is preferable? Again, it's preferable in the sense of what can you do with it? And that's for you to explore. Another strange comment I read one time, I said that there's no one true version of the Dharma. Because that everything you describe is kind of like a map, and all maps distort. So how can, how can any version of the Dharma be the true Dharma? Well, the answer is, look at maps. There are some accurate maps and there are some inaccurate maps. And there are different maps for different purposes. We have a whole book in, the, in our library. It was on the centenary of Saskatchewan. They printed a book of all these different maps of Saskatchewan. And depending on what purpose you have, if you want to find out where the different geological features are, okay, there's one map, and if you want to find out where the different mineral ores can be found, that's another map. If you want to find out where the glaciers were, that's another map. All maps are the same place. They're all accurate, but they're useful for different purposes. So in the same way, the Four Noble Truths are a very useful map. They are a convention, but their convention has lots of uses. And they do contain the Eightfold Path, and there's a right version and there's a wrong version. Just as thinking about perceptions, you see a human being as a human being. You see an animal as an animal. Okay, that's right. You see an animal as, as an inanimate lump. Okay, that's wrong. When you go back and you look at the human being, okay, this is a human being. Okay, what are you going to do with that perception? It's useful for some circumstances. It's not useful for others. So learn to look at your perceptions, both with an eye to how accurate they are and then how useful they are. Think again about the Buddha's statement about the words he would speak. Only if something was true and useful would he speak it. And even then he would have to be clear about what was the right time and the right place for that particular statement. Some statements would be pleasing, other statements would be displeasing. In the same way, perceptions have to be true and beneficial. And there may be some perceptions that you don't want to go to, but they're useful. As the Buddha said, the perception of the foulness of food or the foulness of the body, or the fact that the body is going to die someday and it's going to disintegrate. Those may be unpleasant perceptions, but sometimes they're just exactly what the mind needs. So when you're dealing with these sketches, be clear about the fact that they are sketches. They don't give the total picture of reality, but then they're useful for some things and not useful for others. And a lot of the practice is learning which is which. It's this fact that we're dealing in sketches all the time. This is why cartoons can be so expressive. Sometimes a cartoon conveys an emotion, conveys an idea a lot more clearly than an actual picture of a person, say, or a picture of people. Because the cartoon highlights things, makes them stand out. In the same way, you want to use perceptions as you're meditating that highlight the useful things so you recognize which states of mind should be encouraged and which ones should not be encouraged. So don't just throw perceptions away and say, well, they're all 
mirages, so there's no substance to them, so there's nothing true to, to them at all. That's not the case. There are perceptions that are accurate. There are perceptions that are useful. And they play a huge role in the path. The sermon is made out of perceptions. It's one of the reasons why we have to practice it, but at the same time, someday we're going to put it aside. Because what we're trying to do is arrive at the real thing, arrive at the deathless, arrive at the unconditioned. That's not a sketch. That's not a perception. You've got the reality. So look for the perceptions that point you there. <laughs>